Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Jennifer Rittner, and I am the interim chair for the Design Research Writing and Criticism Department. Uh, Molly Hines, who is the chair, had a baby today, so she is not able to be with us. But we send her our congratulations and look forward to hearing more of her news. Uh, if you are interested in hearing more about the Design Research Writing and Criticism program, I am not going to give you a lecture about it right now, but you are more than welcome to come and speak to me after. And we have, I see several alum here and also several uh, current MA students. But we are here today actually to hear from Susan Yelovich. So I'm going to very briefly tell you some of the things, uh, her, the data points of Susan. Uh, Susan is the Professor Emerita of Design Studies at the School of Art and Design History and Theory at Parsons. Did I say that right, Susan? Yeah, right? Um, where she has taught for, for many years, but also has taught at the Nuovo Academia di Bella Arte in Milan and the New School's Democracy and Diversity Institute in Wrocław, Poland. I was working on that one before. I didn't quite get it right. And among the exhibitions she's curated are Inside Design Now, which was on view at Cooper Hewitt's Triennial in 2003, and for which she wrote the accompanying catalog. Uh, she has written several books, including Design as Future Making, which she wrote with Barbara Adams in 2014, Contemporary World Interiors in 2007, Pentagram Profile in 2004, Design for Life in 1997, and currently, we are here to hear about her latest book, which I'm just unbelievably excited about, Thinking Design Through Literature. But I just wanted to take a moment to tell you, and I was so pleased when Susan came in, we had a chance to talk about how I got to know Susan, which is when she was teaching a class called uh, Global Issues in 21st Century Art and Design, which I think changed titles a few times during the course of her teaching it from 2006 to 2012. And it was a class that was uh, required for all juniors at Parsons, which meant that every junior in uh, the school would come together in the auditorium, hundreds of students, for a very serious lecture and in Thursday evening, if I'm not mistaken, or a Tuesday evening or something. And Susan would introduce these very complex ideas about design and culture and our contemporary moment, and she would frame these issues. And there was a lot to grapple with. And not only did she introduce these, these challenging ideas, but she also introduced the students to, I would say, just an, an unbelievable uh, number of thinkers and philosophers and sociologists and anthropologists and practitioners in the field to talk about their work and to provide case studies and to provide their perspectives on design at this particular moment. And this was enough. If that had been it, that would have been enough. But that wasn't actually all there was to this class, because then she would invite students to read these texts on their own and to come together in seminars with discussion leaders who would then engage in a dialectic around these ideas. And what surfaced in terms of those discussions and what surfaced in their assignments and the practice that they put into creating an artifact of their thinking, I just thought was tremendous. And it was such a thrill to be a part of that class and to work with Susan and to hear her thinking and her framing. And as a design educator, I can honestly say that I don't think I would be teaching had it not been for my ability to kind of work through that process that Susan created uh, for us. So what's exciting about this new book that she has written is I can just imagine all of the thinking and the complex ideas and the, these theories that she's bringing into play, but how she's grounding it all in object and in practice and in materiality, and that she's, I think, going to excite us and provoke us all uh, through this work. So I'm very very excited to introduce Susan Yelovich, and thank you for being here. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I have to say, I am really excited to be here. As you can see, the book is barely out of the box. You're the first um, group of people I've had a chance to share it with, so thank you for coming. Um, now, before I dive in, um, a little preamble's in order. First, thinking design through literature takes um, a very broad view of design. And second, um, it interprets literature in a way that some might think is downright promiscuous. <laughs> the literature I'm concerned with is unlikely to be shelved together in any imaginable system. Um, 
It isn't organized by region, e.g. Latin America, Asia, Africa, nor is it organized by type. Um, you wouldn't find, it's, there's no chronology to the text that I've chosen. And though this is definitely a book about design, it is not a literature of product design, per se, a graphic design or architecture, per se. Not directly, anyway. Instead of thinking in terms of categories of practice, I'm going to propose that we think of design as a way of configuring and reconfiguring things and places. Configurations that set up the conditions for alternate ways of doing things, alternate ways of behaving. Here, design is analogous to plot. And instead of thinking of literature in terms of its conventions, fiction, poems, essays, I propose we think of it as a compendium of scenarios in which things and places act. Here, literature is performance. In short, where design projects possibility, literature activates its potential. The works that I'm concerned with make the experiences and the consequences of design almost palpable, largely because literature shows more than it tells. Now, I realize that's kind of an oxymoron. I mean, we think of literature as telling. But there is a difference between explaining and dramatizing. I mean, you could read a lot of design theory to get at some of the same ideas, but I prefer to read stories. So, but that, that said, it doesn't mean that a poem or a novel isn't also a theory. Like design, each of the literary works I'm going to talk about tonight is a proposition about how we might lead our lives. To that end, you'll see I've set up a kind of call and response between works of literature and works of design, contemporary design. Please note, the design projects that you're going to see are not illustrations of texts. They're not illustrations of novels and poems. Instead, the novels and poems and the design projects each reinforce each other and they amplify each other. They're stories, stories that I've chosen to talk about pose the same questions that we do in design. How far can we go in extending in our bodies? Uh, how, how can we make bodies? <laughs> like Pinocchio, what's, what are the risks involved in, in increasingly we do make bodies these days? Um, what is home? How can we, so very present, contend with the absence that is death? Moreover, taken together, the pros and the projects make a larger point, namely that design is never finished. And that's because design is inextricably, inextricable from its intended um, and unintended consequences. Uh, and those consequences occur out, play out in everyday life in the way designers sometimes can predict, but more often can't. Now, given how vast the terrain of the everyday is, I parsed the book and this talk into eight chapters. Culture, politics, being, technology, domesticity, consumption, the senses, and mortality. What follows is a kind of tasting menu. I've chosen one work of literature and one work of design from each chapter to make the case that design is not only, excuse me, greater than the sum of its parts, but that we cannot act without it. As George Eliot observes so concisely, our deeds are fetters that we forge ourselves. And the second gentleman says, yes, but truly, I think it is the world that brings the iron. So deeds don't exist without the iron. Okay, chapter one. Now, we're going to not begin with iron, but with wood. More precisely, Okisati's wooden doors, which in their different configurations segue nicely into culture. For it's only when we leave home, when we walk through that door and cross the threshold, that we begin to get an understanding of culture, of us, of them, of what's ours. Um, however, as we know all too well, that uh, understanding culture demands coping with cultures. That's when we begin to negotiate between local loyalties and distant attractions. And it's arguable that the work of being together and apart has produced some of the earliest forms of design. As the sociologist Georg Simmel writes, quote, we are at any moment those who separate the connected and connect the separate. The people who first built a path between two places performed one of the greatest human achievements. It was only invisibly 
impressing the path onto the surface of the earth that places were objectively connected. So this most basic, basic spatial move is actually quite profound, if you think of it the way Simmel does. Decisions to connect and divide people and places with paths, bridges, and doors are among the fundamental ways that designers shape culture. And this is the dynamic in the first novel I'm going to bring up, which is Ivo Andrich's The Bridge on the Drina. It's a novel based on an actual bridge in Bosnia, which has a very distinctive form. It swells in the middle. Here you see it. You can sort of tell, see where that projection is up. We're looking at this space here is behind that projection. It's not very grand, but it is a small swelling in the middle of the bridge. And the space, that the swollen space is called a capia. Andrik describes it as, quote, two terraces daringly and harmoniously projecting outwards from the straight line of the bridge over the noisy green waters below, end quote. Note the words daringly and harmoniously. Um, it's risky to leave the comfort of your own kind and sit with the talk with others, especially in communities that are divided by geography, by faith, and by custom. The architect of this bridge dared to risk harmony. He designed the possibility for cultural cross-pollination into its structure that otherwise brought conquest. Andrich tells his reader that soldiers and colonizers would come and they would cross the bridge with reluctance. They entered the town with disgust. I mean, this little town that this bridge brought them to was kind of, you know, nowheresville. Um, and these are usually Austrian-Hungarian diplomats coming over and their soldiers. Um, so anyway, they crossed the bridge with reluctance. They entered the town with disgust and at first were a world apart like drops of oil and water. Yet a year or so later, they could be found sitting for hours in the capia, smoking through thick amber cigarette holders. The bridge is no longer just a means of getting from point A to point B. Its capia offers a place for locals and occupiers alike to drink tea, to catch up on gossip, um, hear the news from the front, and watch wedding and funeral processions of otherwise segregated communities of Christians, Jews, and Muslims. Now here, we see the same cosmopolitan intention built into another bridge. This one in Sarajevo was designed and built in 2012, so 435 years after Sinan's bridge. Sinan was the architect of the first bridge I showed. The architects reprised the capia by turning it 180 degrees, making it into a loop with a bench for rest and conversation. It's an innately Pacific structure, although Pacific may be a bit of an exaggeration. The capilla is closer to a tactic that mitigates the directional force, AKA the strategy of a bridge's normal use and structure. And I say this because as Michelle de Certeau reminds us, all structures claim power by claiming space. For example, we are unable to enter or leave this room except by that door. And keys might be involved. Um, not a big problem, right? But it, it's kind of instructive in showing how much power we accede to architecture. And given that power is intrinsic to politics, some would say politics is power and power is politics, it's not surprising that the issues of space dominate so much of the plot lines of literature produced in totalitarian regimes. <clears throat> I need a drink of water before I say Sigismund Krzyzanowski. <laughs> Sig Sigismund Krzyzanowski's Quadraturin is a masterpiece of politics as space. Not the space of official grandstands or marching parades, but the intimate space of home. In Soviet times, the very idea of home was of course suspect. People in Russia and her satellites either lived in communal apartments or very, very tiny rooms of their own. Krasnovsky introduces us to one such person, a man we only know as Sutulin. As the story begins, Sutulin is approached with a bizarre proposition. A man knocks on his door and says, quote, I'm here on business. You see, I, that is we, uh, are conducting, how shall I put it, um, well, an experiment, I suppose. Under wraps for now, I won't hide the fact a well-known foreign firm has an interest in our concern. For we have discovered, this is a secret now, an agent for biggerizing rooms. 
Want to try it? There's um, a further inducement. Quadraturin, the said biggerizing agent, is free. Any warning bells that might have been set off by the words secret, design, and uh, secret and foreign are quickly forgotten. Sutulin takes the dubious agent, which is a tube of paint, and immediately starts painting his room. Um, his room is all of eight by 10 feet. The problem comes when he runs out of paint before he gets to the ceiling and the room starts to warp. Sutulin needs more quadraturin. Trouble is, he can't find the salesman. Even more disturbing is the fact that his room keeps growing. Every time he goes out to look for more, he comes back to find his possessions shrinking away from him um, to the point where he can't find them at all. In fact, the space becomes so vast that in the end, he cannot find his way out. So Tulin is both victimized and punished for wanting more space. The price of his rejection of Soviet values or even experimenting with them is life imprisonment. Yet Krzyznowski seems to equivocate in his judgment, on the one hand suggesting that Satulin should have been happy with his lot, on the other suggesting that Satulin, um, as an individual has a complete lack of agency despite the fact that he's been offered a biggerizing agent. Um, these two stances, being punished or being properly punished, um, are not mutually exclusive though. My guess is that Krzyznowski um, is indicting the idea of single-minded enforcement of rules, of ideals, communist or otherwise. This kind of purity of principle destroys any possibility for a more generous politics, the politics of debate. Now, transpose the story to Brooklyn and you have what you see in this outdoor installation. Here, Maria Elena Gonzalez replicates the floor plan of a six room unit in Red Hook East housing in Brooklyn. The outlines of a kitchen, bath, bedroom, and closets have been gently warped to transform the apartment into a flying carpet and a fantasy of living in larger quarters. The fable of Kronofsky's quadraturin is played out here in the context of American public housing. And I say play quite deliberately because both the author and the artist, who incidentally grew up in communist Cuba, had to master the art of subversive humor in order to speak truth to power. Perhaps this um, urge, this ambition to grow our spaces, to extend what we have for better and worse is programmed into the DNA of being human and thus designing. For me, the ultimate design project has to do with exceeding our very selves. And there is one particular aspect of designing life forms that is especially compelling, the making of human surrogates and its relationship to human reproduction, which for now at least is a process that involves two sexes something that seems to have frustrated more than one man. It didn't take too much digging to realize that for generations, the golems of literature were the exclusive province of men who at the risk of stating the obvious cannot otherwise give birth. So I became convinced that I had to find a literary work about a female golem created by a female. And lo and behold, there's one and to the best of my knowledge, only one. It's Cynthia Ozick's 1997 novel, The Putter Messer Papers. Here, the power of procreation is given to one Ruth Puttermesser. When we meet her, she's in a very bad way. She's just been fired from her job in city government and dumped by her boyfriend, her married lover, for, of all things, reading Hebrew in bed. Um, the morning after their breakup, Ruth wakes up to find an adolescent girl named Xanthope in her apartment. It turns out she is our golem, brought into being by Ruth herself, albeit unwittingly. Born of Ruth's despair, Xanthope was fertilized by soil from the pots of broken houseplants and the pages of the New York Sunday Times, the debris left behind in the wake of her lover's very acrimonious departure. Just like her male counterparts, Xanthope comes into being through words and dirt. That's how you make a golem. Incidentally, Xanthope is also the name of Socrates' wife. Um, in short order, Xanthope moves from cleaning Ruth's flat to managing her campaign to become mayor of New York. And miraculously, Puttermesser does win. 
And even more miraculously, the city begins to flourish. Now remember, this is written in 97. The city, it was not, it was more grimy, grimy than it was shiny. It was still kind of sad. Now, powered by Ruth's dream of a perfect civic society and her golem's tireless energy, crime drops to nothing. Subways sparkle, sanitation trucks are heralded by flutes, and office workers flock to libraries. The city is transformed into a Latter-day Eden. And it is until Xanthope discovers sex, at which point Eros trumps justice. I shouldn't use that word. Eros crushes justice. <laughs> Sorry, Mayor Putumusser is booted out of office and the city reverts to form. Like all utopias, Xanthope isn't fertile um, and her urban paradise is equally barren. There can be no next generation for the Golem, female or no, and there can be no better city if it's already the best. Um, that said, this instinct to improve is hardwired into us. Uh, we seem to do it over and over again. Generation after generation, we reproduce our ideals in approximate form. And if we didn't, we surely would stagnate. However, when we do it with misplaced confidence in forces outside of our own, we have to ask who or what takes responsibility for the consequences. <clears throat> Designers are in this sense like demiurges, putting things out in the world as articles of faith. Um, an increasing uh, practice increasingly under scrutiny um, by many designers, but in particular, I was intrigued by this particular set of pieces by Beata Konarska and Pavel Konarska, Konarski and Konarska. Um, the Madonna lamps may seem a really odd pair for Ozick's Jewish golem, but they too critique the hope that we put in magical thinking, regardless of religion or lack thereof. Here, the convergence of secular and sacred is fitting to someone who we are told was an ordinary girl graced with an immaculate conception. Each is painted a different color to suggest that Mary or the idea of a protective mother um, should be long to everybody, all races, not just white Polish Catholics. Now, for all the blasphemy that this may seem to evoke, um, I don't see these four Marys as a rejection of faith just the institutionalization that sets it in cement. Does that mean designers shouldn't make finite golems, AKA products that promise improvement? No, they just shouldn't allow them to be marketed as miracles as far as I'm concerned. Of course, there have been times when technological advances have seemed indeed miraculous, but today technological change is a non-event. It's almost impossible to shock us. Still in all, we continue to invest our various and sundry appliances with something akin to immortality. Just think of the annoyance you feel when your phone battery dies. You know, we know better. Um, we don't think they'll, I mean, to think that they'll last forever, but it's still sort of unsettling. Um, we do experience something that it's not shock and awe felt by previous generations, but we still note it. For shock and awe, we have Marcel Proust. Early on in his opus, Remembrance of Things Past, we find him making a telephone call to his grandmother. It's the 1920s, and the technology is so new, it has no vocabulary. So Proust defaults to the language of myth, observing that, <clears throat> quote, we need only, oh, sorry. <laughs> Proust is a mouthful, too, his, so be patient with the, with the phrasing. We need only, so that the miracle may be accomplished, apply our lips to the magic orifice and invoke the vigilant virgins, to whose voices we listen every day without ever coming to know their faces, and who are our guardian angels in the dizzy realm of darkness, whose portals they so jealously guard. The Danaids of the unseen, who incessantly empty and fill and transmit to one another the urns of sound. The ironic furies, who just as we were murmuring a confidence to a loved one in the hope that no one could hear us, cry brutally, I'm listening. Um, these are the priestesses of the invisible, the young ladies of the telephone. He's talking about switchboard operators in case you're curious. <laughs> I doubt you remember them, but I guarantee that this next passage about a delayed connection will resonate and seem a little more familiar. 
He says, habit requires so short a time to divest of their mystery, the sacred forces with which we are in contact, that not having had my call at once, my immediate thought was that it was all very long and very inconvenient, and I almost decided to lodge a complaint. You know, it's like, so far, the workings of technology are both mysterious and irritating. But what of the exchange itself? When he's finally connected to his grandmother, and it takes a while, Proust tells us that he notices for the first time, quote, how sweet that voice was. What I held compressed in this little bell at my ear was our mutual affection. The tedium of obedience or the fire of rebellion which neutralized the affection I felt for her were at that moment eliminated and indeed might be eliminated forever. He makes us realize that the telephone is more than just a conduit. It changes his behavior. He speaks to her more sweetly because the phone focuses his concentration on her voice. And in its instability, in the times he gets disconnected, it also anticipates her death. Like all technologies, it does so with a, with a profound indifference to Proust and to us. To that point, I'm sure you've all noticed that increasingly, no matter what the ads say, technology has less and less to do with us. It talks not to us, but to other algorithms, even when it gets inside our heads, as this project does. This device picks up neuromuscular signals in the jaw and the face, which are triggered when we talk to ourselves. When we wonder, for example, how much something costs or what time it is. Here, our silent vocalizations connect us not to people, but to AI assistants. How is this different from talking to Siri? Probably not much, except that Siri can only hear our voices. She can't read our minds. And as far as I know, she still can't clean the house. I know there's um, those robots on the floor, but they only do the floor. They don't wash the windows. Now, as this chapter suggests, house cleaning is something I take quite seriously. It's an under-recognized form of labor and an under-recognized microcosm of design. The state of affairs we call domestic, with all the comfort it implies, is no small production. It requires theater, props, and actors, and is performed on the under the burden of cultural assumptions about class, race, and gender. It is the latter, gender, that concerns Vyshlava Shemborska in her poem, The End and the Beginning. Written in 1993, it's impossible not to think these lines were first thought in 1945 after the Nazis pulverized 80% of Warsaw. Quote, after every war, someone has to tidy up. Things won't pick themselves up after all. Someone has to trudge through the sludge and ashes, through the sofa springs, the shards of glass, the bloody rags. Someone has to lug the posts to prop the wall. Someone has to glaze the window, set the door in its frame. No sound bites, no photo opportunities, and it takes years. All the cameras have gone to other wars. Someone broom in hand still remembers how it was. Someone else listens, nodding his unshattered head. But others are bound to be bustling nearby who'll find all that a little bit boring. But those who, kn those who knew what this war was all about must make way for those who know little and less than that. And at last, nothing less than nothing. Even in the traditionally masculine context of war, cleaning is feminized. It is a woman's voice that speaks to tidying up and focuses on the debris of sofa springs and shards of glass. She would have known them as bits of the infrastructure of her home, and she would have recognized them readily, no matter how bloodied. But what, hasn't, what isn't recognized, and what no one cares to see, is that the violent erasures of rubble and debris all but ensures more conflicts. This drawing by the late Libya Woods is not about cleaning up. Instead, it's about reconfiguring the rubble to make it visible. Woods is proposing a type of post-conflict architecture to compel us to remember what we choose to forget. It's as though he was responding to Shimborska across borders and time, and the drawing itself is closer to a poem, of course, than a real work of architecture, so they have that in common. Meanwhile, in too many places to count, streets continue to be cleared and war domesticated. We take the same Sisyphusian view of conflict that we do of housework. It's never done. 
Now, something that else that is circular and also destructive is the curse of constant consumption. When our possessions seem out of sync with ourselves, the selves that we want to be, we reactivate the cycle of replacement. We cannot seem to stop ourselves, though it generates so much waste. Now that said, consumption can also be a genuine source of pleasure. That's why we vacillate between being suspicious of, suspicious of things, think of the values that we associate with hoarders, um, and celebrate things as edifying, think of museums or book collectors. This is the tension played out in Little Calvino's, Italo Calvino's short story, Santa's Children. Anybody read this story? I'm just curious. Okay. Um, the protagonist is a man named Mark Ovaldo. He's a peasant who recently moved to the big city for better prospects. When we meet him, it's Christmas. And quote, the big companies, till yesterday coldly concerned with calculating dividends, open their hearts to human affections and smile. The sole thought of the board of directors, now that it's Christmas, was to give joy to their fellow man, sending gifts accompanied by messages of goodwill, both to other companies and to private individuals. Every firm feels obliged to buy a great stock of products from a second firm to service presents for the third firm. And those firms, for their part, buy yet another, fir another firm's stock of presents for the others. One of the companies that are excited about giving gifts to each other, um, comes up with what it thinks is the novel idea of sending out men dressed up as Santa Claus to deliver their corporate gifts. And our hero, Mark Rivaldo, enlists as one of these Santas, naively thinking he's truly on a mission of goodwill and that his, um, his costume will really work its magic, at least on children. But by the time he gets home, they've already seen, his children have already seen the janitor's brother-in-law, the father of the twins across the street, and the uncle of Ernestina riding around the city in the very same getup. It seems that every major company was suiting up pensioners, street vendors, and otherwise unemployed people. And if this wasn't all bad enough, at one stop in his rounds, Marco, Val Marco Valdo actually meets a boy who is bored by Christmas. Um, he occupies his time by just keeping a tally of all the corporate gifts that come in. Marco Valdo's is number 312. By now, Marco Valdo isn't so surprised at the child's jaded re reaction, but he's flabbergasted when one of the sons who's come along for the ride, um, little Michelino, asks him if this little boy is poor. <laughs> As it happens, said little boy's father is the president of the Society for the Implementation of Christmas Consumption and a very wealthy man. Now, oblivious to these kinds of uh, fine distinctions, young Michelino innocently decides to give the poor little rich boy some modest presents, a hammer, a slingshot, and a box of matches. And I suspect you could guess the rest. John Franco smashes everything in sight um, he, with the hammer. He uses the slingshot to destroy all the Christmas ornaments, and he sets the house on fire. Marco Valdo thinks he's really screwed. But what happens is quite surprising. Um, the president of the Society for Christmas Consumption is overjoyed that for the first time his son is happy. And he has an epiphany. He invents the destructive gift. In the process, three everyday objects of design move from gift to, gift to commodity, not to discourage gluttony, but to excite it all over again. As you can see, from this issue of Colors, one of 13 edited by the late and truly Miss Tibor Kalman, um, this cover similarly equates consumption with death. What better object than a jewel-handled gun to put on the cover of an issue devoted to what the world buys? Here diamonds and gold coalesce in the ne plus ultra of creative destruction, a handgun, second only to the body parts featured inside the issue. It seems there's nothing we won't put a price tag on. Here, Kalman reminds us of design's Achilles heel. Predicated on improvement, design risks modeling a careless approach to seeking and buying newer and better things. Thankfully, that model of design is changing with the growing attention to materials and the conditions of labor that produce the, multi the, the goods that make up our possessions. I think the interest in materials today is, is really terrifically exciting. It's like we suddenly woke up thanks to Greta Thunberg and other people. Um, anyway, now where consumption tends to get a bad rap, the senses are enjoying a heyday. 
you probably noticed the growing number of conferences and books devoted to sensory design. That's because designing with the senses yields richer and more complex experiences, though again, not without some ambivalence. This equivocation is the hallmark of Oren Pomek's writing. If you know him, he's always writing about Istanbul, which sits between two continents, east and west, right? So Pomex brings us face to face, as it were, with this ambivalence in this short piece called The Old Meaning Speaks Out. And I think you'll recognize the protagonist. Hi, thank you for reading me. I should be happy to be here, though I can't help but feeling confused. Once upon a time, I was just a meaning. It never occurred to me that I was also an object and I didn't even have a mind. I was nothing more than a humble sign passing between two beautiful minds. But there's no turning back to the days when I was just a meaning. For anyone not already attuned to the sensory, nation of reading and sensory nature of reading and writing, Pamuk makes it abundantly clear that letters have bodies, stories have bodies. Letter forms are shaped as much by chisels and brushes and electric, electronic pulses as they are by alphabets and linguistic ticks. Bodies, their bodies are proportioned, they're scaled, they're weighted and clothed by their designers who animate them with personalities ranging from introvert to extrovert. Pomek's talking font isn't sure which he is. You could say that the letters suffer from a split plus personality disorder or that his letters conversely are in therapy to mend the rift. This typeface by Liren Turkinich definitely comes down on the side of reconciliation. With a hybrid of Arabic and Hebrew script, the designer seeks a measure of compatibility, if not exactly peace, between Jewish and Palestinian readers. Each half letter is chosen according to the word spelling in its native script. Here we see the word watermelon in Hebrew and Arabic at the top, and then you see it converging into a single word slash font derived from both at the bottom. Turkinich says that his experimental writing system, quote, allows each person to read fluently the language they feel most comfortable with without compromising on grammar or vocabulary, but also without ignoring the other who is always present. Here you can't think the word watermelon without seeing it. Moreover, the sense of sight makes us think much more than watermelon. Fittingly, the last chapter of this book has to do with our last chapter, death. Of course, apart from euthanasia, dying isn't designed, though confronting death invariably does involve design. It has its own material landscape from coffins to funeral homes. But it, it's one that isn't activated, that landscape isn't activated usually until after we die. But is the dividing line so strict um, between before and after? Haruki Murakami thinks not, as we learn in Tony Takatani. Ironically, the story begins at one of life's most affirming moments. Tony Takatani has just met the woman he will marry. Apart from her indefinable allure, he's just attracted to her for reasons he can't quite fathom, he says the next thing that caught his attention was her clothes. She wore her clothes with such naturalness and grace that she could have been a bird that had enveloped itself in a special wind as it prepared to fly off to another world. He had never seen a woman wear her clothes with such apparent joy. But before she flies off to another world, and she will, we follow them on their European honeymoon where they visit fashion houses the way other couples visit museums and churches. However, it isn't until they're back in Tokyo when Tony, till Tony becomes concerned about um, her tendency, her quote, to buy too many clothes. <laughs> Confronted with a piece of clothing, she seemed incapable of restraint. A strange look would come over her, even her voice would change. The fear he saw, the first time he saw this happen, Tony Takatani thought she had suddenly taken ill. But when he ultimately does lose his wife, it isn't to illness, but to chance. She's run over by a car on her way to another store. As abandoned as he feels, Tony isn't quite alone. Um, he's left with enormous closets full of couture dresses. He takes to visiting her closet the way others would visit a grave. Sitting there, he watches as, quote, their rich colors dance in space like pollen rising from flowers 
lodging in his eyes and ears and nostrils. The frills and buttons and lace and epaulets and pockets and belts sucked greedily at the room's air, thinning it out until he could hardly breathe. Against the stark reality of her absence, his wife's clothes are all too present. They remind us of the mater that material disintegrates far more slowly than we do. In fact, it might be the ultimate ins insult to human vanity, but critically important to designers concerned about their environmental legacy. Indeed, Tony has inherited a quintessentially material problem, but rather than suffocate under the emotional and physical weight of the clothes, he ends up giving them away. These days, the particles that sit between states of life and death are just as likely to be electronic. Increasingly, designers are trying to sustain the lives of our data long after we can't, can enter it anymore. So counterintuitively, this project insists on its ephemerality, and by extension, our own. Hash to ash, everything saved will be lost, was made by a collective in Warsaw called Pan Generator. In this museum installation, they invited visitors to take selfies, which appear on a screen and then vanish only to reappear below in pieces of black gravel. And they actually used mapping software to track the movement of digital particles and create a one-to-one -one correspondence of pixels and granules. Haruki Murakami's bereft protagonist experiences something similar with his dead wife's clothing. The difference is that Tony feels that he's suffocating from their closeness in the air, where the analog particles of selfies can't reassemble themselves into anything remotely like an atmosphere. In both cases, however, the selfie and the dresses are banished. We are forced to see them go, forced to confront the fact that design cannot solve the ultimate problem. Though, on a more optimistic note, it can make a difference. It can make it less problematic. This is a biodegradable burial suit made out of um, mushroom-based fibers that respects the ground that it's intended for. So on that most slightly more optimistic note, <laughs> on a chapter on death, I thank you for coming. And I'm going to leave up these credits so that in case you missed the names of who and what I was talking about, they're there while we take questions, or I take questions, if you have any. <laughs> How are we doing on time? Oh, good. We have a few minutes. Oh, questions. fantastic. Does it, anyone want to ask anything? I mean, you could argue this is, uh, I mean, I can imagine someone thinking, well, this isn't really much about design. How did you research the books? Um, well, for years, uh, it's a shaggy dog story, but I'll tell it anyway. My son came home from college with his thesis, and he'd written an essay about William Gaddis's Carpenter Gothic, in which the telephone, the radio, and the TV, which are meant to enhance communication, end up causing just the opposite. And I read it and thought, he's writing about design. And I started teaching a class. And I would sit down and think, at Parsons, you don't know who's coming into the room. I imagine it's kind of the same here. I could be talking to architects, I could be talking to product designers, I could be talking to an anthropologist from the new school. So I made a point of finding, I, I mean, I love to read, so I had a, a lot of readings already. Um, I like reading fables where there's two stories being told. I always tell students it's like the, the tortoise and the hare. It's not really about turtles and rabbits, but you can't tell the story without it. So I went through what my list, and then I did some, a few weird things. Um, for Proust, I thought, I just flipped through the pages. I literally kept looking for an object. That's how I found it, because I was determined to have something that was not particularly current. Um, with Cynthia Ozick, it was uh, searching online essays about columns, and somebody mentions Ozick. It was a lot of online searching, um, in addition to years of reading. Um, I will say I'm grateful to friends who recommend books. Like I wouldn't have read The Bridge on the Drina were it not for a Polish sociologist who was one of the she was the only woman at the round table when Poland shifted from communism to democracy in 1989 and she tells the story of the bridge on the Drina to show how a circle 
can be more convivial than a square. And the tables, when they negotiated democracy in Poland, were circular tables. And she introduced me to the bridge on the Drina as kind of an antecedent to that. So it was um, very haphazard. It set me down all kinds of rabbit holes. I discovered, when I was thinking about men and creatures, uh, making creatures, um, there were men who actually tried to do it. Um, friends of Aristotle apparently thought sperm was far superior to menstrual blood. And in the 16th century, there was an alchemist named Paracelsus, I always say Paraclesis, but it's Paracelsus, I think, who actually had a recipe for making a creature not born of a woman. It involved keeping sperm warm with horse dung or something. <laughs> so I went down all kinds of weird rabbit holes, um, but mostly I love it when an author tells me about design. Andrik has a line of his own where he describes the bridge where he outdoes Simmel, and he talks about how being on a bridge, you're both firmly on the ground and swinging through the air. I mean, we just don't think about things that way very often. So, you know, that's, that's where I have fun, and that's what, you know, gives me stimulation. Sorry, I can't really see people. <laughs> Hi, that was a great lecture. Thank um, you. I really enjoyed at the beginning you were speaking about how space is the configuration of power. I'm curious when you were doing some of the research on literature and the space of the page, if you came across any um, moments where you were seeing the actual written word configured as that same exhibition of power. Um, well, the Hebrew Arabic alphabet was a mediation of power in a sense. We do know that power is not even in those communities in uh, that part of the world. So that was an attempt to negotiate somehow with, with typefaces. Um, most of the power, the stories in the politics section had to do with space, but not all of them. Um, there's a famous story by Kafka called In the Penal Colony. And it's basically about uh, what I th think of as a big sewing machine that stitches or your sentence on your back when you've been convicted of a crime. And so there's an object as an exercise in power. It's a little more complex than that, but I actually found an artist who did a self-portrait with his own blood that looked like stitches. So it's amazing. There's another story by, it's going back to research, um, there's a story by John Cheever in the technology chapter called The Enormous Radio. The radio is actually listens into other apartments. And so I Googled, just for the hell of it, big radios. And lo and behold, uh, a woman in Italy, a designer in Italy, had made a giant radio for an installation in Milan. And it would have been sort of a superficial comparison, but for the fact that behind the radio, there were these poles where you could listen in. So the, where Cheever's radio is like a spying tool, this allows you to listen in to plaintive songs, to bird cries, um, and it was just, you know, it's, it's just moving to me that other people are thinking, dealing with the same issues we're dealing with. Um, that a radio is not, you know, basically the, sto the, the big story is these things are not just instrumental. They don't just press on, press off, and do a job. They have a lot more going on, if we care to think of them that way. Oh, I did, because I noticed every chapter began with a quote of, an art of a writer that was not the writer that the chapter was about. Like, you begin with a Lydia Davis quote in a chapter that... Uh, Maybe is a Murakami or something, or is somebody else? Well, you know, there's a, there's a method to my madness here. I, I wanted to let you know we were entering a new chapter, um, but I didn't want to go, yes, here it is. You're right. This is just a signal we're in, we're in this terrain of domesticity. But this is a great poem. Under all this dirt, the forest, you have a very poem. <laughs> So, I mean, if you think about it long enough, I can go down the rabbit hole of, you know, floors being something that protects us from dirt. That's why we design them. And yet, you know, we, it's, it's a lovely piece. It's just, it's two, sentence, two phrases. Um, and the bigger point is, you know, do I really have to clean it? <laughs> um, but your point being that I started with, ch not every chapter begins with a quote, many do. But um, it's discussed. Here, 
this whole paragraph is about this poem. This was just, I was trying to um, keep this lecture to 45 minutes, which I think I did. Um, so that, that was the rationale behind the presentation. But I'm happy to answer any, any deeper questions or if I missed your point. Well, you're really good. You're reading it. <laughs> I was move. I, well, I didn't move on fast enough to this slide. <laughs> so that's my bad. <laughs> um, one more. Qu yeah, we'll take one more question. Have you considered uh, science fiction as a possible uh, genre? Because I feel like in science fiction, like in Isaac Asimov, you know, his whole subject is talking about robots, and then people pry into science fiction and try to imagine what comes from the text as real objects. There's a lot of science fiction in this book. Each chapter analyzes five novels and two poems on average, sometimes eight. So in the chapter on bodies, it starts with Pinocchio. And the best thing about Pinocchio is that before Geppetto has even taken an ax to the wood, the wood is laughing at it. The wood is living, which given the interest in materials today among designers, I found really provocative. But it ends with Primo Levi's um, science fiction, which I hadn't been aware of until recently. Um, and it's all about VR. And it's written just about a year after the, the first VR experiments were done. And you know, a guy manages to make a double of himself so he can have a mistress and a wife. I mean, they're funny and they're, they're dangerous as well. But yes, yeah, science fiction plays an enormous role. I just picked one story from each chapter. There, believe me, there's tons more. And a word of, um, a practical word. Um, you all have flyers on your chairs which have a discount code for the book. I'm not trying to hawk it. I'm gonna apologize for its price tag. The publisher intends these books largely for libraries. They've promised me there'll be a paperback in a year, which uh, a student might be able to afford. Um, it's in libraries everywhere. But they only have hardbacks, and um, I bought three so you could look at them, but it cost me $100 a piece. Yes. It's not really a business model. This is a, <laughs> at all. So I, I do apologize for that, but you know, the truth of the matter is that I, I talked to 25 publishers, and they all pretty much said the same thing. Well, what shelf does it go on? Does it go on literature or design? So for all the talk about interdisciplinarity that you hear in school, um, it's not marketable. Um, so Routledge, I am deeply grateful for recognizing that this was a design book. Um, Routledge is the publisher of choice for aspiring PhDs. I'm semi-retired, so that's not what I, but you know, even though there are lots of um, things to make me hesitate, um, they really did me an enormous favor and they let me hire a designer and use color, which is very unusual in an academic book. Lorraine Wilde designed the book. Although she didn't design the cover because apparently in their so-called business model, this is part of a series. <laughs> and so I got to pick the colors, but um, it was tragic to me that Lorraine didn't get to do the cover. Well, so that's all the behind the scenes stuff. Great, well, uh, let's give Susan another round of applause and um, we can, continue the conversation over drinks and some snacks. Uh, she will hopefully join us and yes. you can touch her book, flip through her book, you know, whatever. There's three copies, so, you know, you might have to get in I line. I actually have sold some, but... <laughs> yes. But I'm just warning you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, everyone.